So we're talking today about the role of cultural organisations in an earth crisis. And um, my particular interest is in museums, but um, I take a very broad view of what a museum is. And I'm also interested in the role of cultural practitioners, individual workers um, who might work across many different institutions. So um, when I talk about cultural organisations, I'm talking very broadly. Um, and so I just want to dive right into this situation, you know, a big view on this um, situation that we are all in. Um, you might think I'm going to talk about the pandemic, but I'm starting with this big ongoing crisis, which is the global temperature rise over the past 170 years. And this um, diagram is the warming stripes that um, are being used as a, as a global standard to try to very clearly communicate the shift from cool temperatures through to hotter temperatures and this works because red and blue are universal standard um, uh, color um, people understand these colors because they can feel them in their bodies um, and i just want you to notice the um the change when the change happens it's not really towards the far end it's actually in the middle so our temperatures actually started warming um, around a century ago. And that's, um, so actually the emergency, the planetary emergency began around a century ago. Not uh, in the last one or two years when Greta Thunberg started protesting. <laughs> so yes, climate is the big story because it is so um, extraordinary in its impacts, potential impacts, but it's a bigger story than just the climate. We are in an earth crisis, which has many manifestations. And the cause of the earth crisis is an extractive and ecocidal way of living. Extraction is, is a big, word it isn't just about the extraction of coal and fossil fuels it's about treating nature as a resource and not putting it back it's um it's a degenerative way of thinking about nature and ecocide is um is an act of of de of devastating harm to to the environment so those um the general history of extraction and then big acts of harm are creating an earth crisis. And that's leading to three big impacts, biodiversity collapse, climate breakdown, and often forgotten, but perhaps now it won't be forgotten, human health pandemics. And each one ramps up the impacts of the other. So when we are um, working as a climate museum, we're actually not just dealing with the climate and we're not just focusing on technical issues about energy. We're trying to help people understand the bigger context, um, the history the, and the potential future impacts. So um, yeah, this is a collage I made. So I'm an, I, Although my background is very much in education and um, consultancy and research, I'm really trying, I'm now becoming more of an artist. I am calling myself an artist or a creative curator um, in my old age. <laughs> so um, I'll talk a bit about Climate Museum UK. So I, um, most of my time I'm a consultant, I am a researcher, I work with lots of museums and organisations helping them understand their audiences and develop education programmes and I've been very frustrated that so many organisations are not um, widening their horizons to um, understand or rep represent the, the environment um, <laughs> the environmental crisis is just not on the agenda um, and this 
might not be so true in other countries of Europe, but it's certainly the case in the UK. Um, sometimes I was doing projects and the brief would say, please go and ask young people what they think about their future, but don't ask them about climate change. You know, so it was being bracketed out or put to the side and frustrated by this and building on many years of um, personal projects and campaigning, I decided to form um, an organization with, with the name of a museum. And so giving it the name of a museum gives it a sense of possible authority or respect. Um, but at the same time, it's a very expanded definition of what a museum is. So we don't have a building. Um, we may not ever have a building, but I would love it if we could have a, a base. But we are a mobile. Even if we had a base, we would still be mobile because it's really important to go to where people are to, to respond to their environment and help them really think about their particular situation. Um, and also we want to work with other museums and cultural organisations to help them um, open up to the wider climate and environment. Um, so really, we're, we're also a museum because we're collecting, we're um, stirring and collecting responses to the climate and ecological emergency. So it's quite a big challenge. Um, oh, hang on, I should have said the, um, the logo there is two overlapping speech bubbles. So this um, symbolises conversation um, and the speech bubbles come very close. They really overlap. So the idea is to bring people closer together from their different binary positions to find common ground. Um, and the blue and the red relates to the warming stripes colours. And so we are, we are a team of people. We are um, all um, freelance artists, designers, communicators, um, educators and we've come together in the past 18 months and we formed um, a community interest company in December so we're very new um, and we're still very much at the stage of testing and prototyping our approach we were about to do um, a very large number of workshops but all of those were cancelled um, we were going to be traveling around to festivals and really testing and trying out all of our different materials but um, that's all been put on the back burner so we're having to take a moment to reflect a bit more on our ethos and our principles um, and so these are our six principles we are intersectional so justice matters um, uh, we're much less about climate science and more about the human experience and the emotional relational aspects of it. We are compassionate, so uh, we support people to express feelings and to be compassionate for each other. We are planet kind, of course, um, so that means that we refuse funding of fossil fuel sponsors and we try to <coughs> model kindness to the planet in all of our actions. So for example, yesterday, I spent quite a lot of the day going around with a watering can with a big sign on saying acts of tree kindness and explaining that we're in drought conditions and I was watering young baby trees. Um, so it's really about trying to express <laughs> and model kindness. Um, we are participatory, so every event is um, is open-ended. We don't have a, a, a message that we want to get across by the end of the session. It's really about inviting participants to make their own uh, tools for communicating climate or using our resources in their own way to have a conversation. Um, we're also holistic, so we believe that the environment is the, the, uh, the ground from which all issues arise. Um, humans are nature, there are no others, everything is connected. 
the the sixth principle there is about being positopian and i'm going to talk about that later so we'll just leave that one to to the side um so i'm just going to run through six useful approaches or ways of thinking about culture in an earth crisis um these are ideas that we're playing with and um uh working as well uh as in advocacy projects or campaigns to um to explore and the first one you know this is you know thinking about the how the earth crisis is now coming very close this is now people are now declaring that this is an emergency so my suggestion is that cultural organizations can be first responders and this is the launch of a movement that i've helped to found called culture declares emergency or culture declares so we are um, now a thousand cultural workers and organizations who have declared a climate and ecological emergency and in that declaration we are um, expressing and facing the truth we are committing to take action and we are seeking justice in every aspect of our work and um, so this is from the launch event where um, uh, lots of cultural declarers paraded around the big cultural institutions of London. This is Tate Modern um, and they're wearing grass coats made by the ecological artists Ackroyd and Harvey um, and their coats read truth and action. Um, and there's a white horse too. <laughs> Uh, so we, we as a community are a community of first responders and um, you, it's actually interesting how some of these declarers are now responding to the emergency of the pandemic. For example, um, Birmingham museums are using their um, shop, um, they've turned their shop into a community food shop. So it is really possible to um, to react and support people in need once you've you know realised that that's your role. And um, another aspect of being an emergency responder isn't just about reacting now to um, to trouble. It's actually about working with people so that they can um, change the system so that trouble is mitigated. So rather than um, encouraging cultural audiences to be consumers, we can shift them to becoming citizens, but beyond that, we can shift them to become ecological citizens, which means really being a system changer. So all of these different three frames are ways that you can change your definition of what consumer, citizen and um, system changer are about um, sort of you know run perhaps this can be like a mission you know our program the mission of our program is to turn people into people that are able to change the system and then the next frame is one of our principles which is about being positopian and does anyone has anyone heard this word before no um, so I invented this word. Um, it essentially means that um, it's a it's a vision of integrating people, bringing people together um, who might be stuck in a overly optimistic utopian position or an overly depressed dystopian position when they think about the future. And you know, people argue between those two positions. So. What we're wanting to do and have been starting to do is running activities where people are able to um, see the cone of the future as actually much wider open than in this diagram. Um, the earth crisis means that the possibilities are the potential is much, much wider. We are at a critical moment when if we only imagine the worst, we will we will keep um, uh, we will just succumb 
and play along with the worst possible scenarios. So we have to um, also imagine the flip side. What is the best possible way that we can live? And not just imagine it, but imagine ways of bringing it into being. And if we just argue, we won't bring it into being. So um, we need to braid together, weave together the most um, uh, awful scenarios of the future and the most beautiful scenarios into the possible. And um, in order to do that, we have to allow people to imagine the worst, but we mustn't let them be stuck there. So our, our workshops are about moving people through those, those different scenarios and helping them to take steps beyond. Um, so that was being positopian. Um, I'm not actually looking at the chat. So um, if you have got concerns or can't understand anything, then you might have to shout. I'm sorry. Um, but moving on. Um, another absolutely core principle is about being echocentric. So you, this might be considered as um, um, instead of caring for humans, you only care for other beings. But it's not like that at all. Being echocentric is actually a widened perspective. It's actually um, opening up your, um, your vision so that you're aware of of other species that you might not see, that might be in other environments, that might um, uh, that might be too small for you to see. For example, being aware of the microbiota in your gut and the importance of that for your health is a way of being ecocentric. You know, we are hosts to possibly to up to four thousand other species in our bodies. So, um, you know, caring for those beings is an important way of being healthy um, and just as an example of being ecocentric bristol museum um, worked with some school children um, to to think about how they could honor the um, extinct or endangered species in the museum and the children decided that they should put funeral shrouds on them um, and while telling the story of these animals so that's encouraging ecocentricity. Um, and a next way of thinking is about thinking about the economy. And um, if you don't know it, then I recommend Kate Rayworth and her book on donut economics. She's just agreed, I think, with um, the C40, you know, the um, 40 cities that are working on climate change, that she's going to work with them to apply donut economics um, to the post COVID-19 recovery. So her donut is the green circle on the right. It's um, really about ensuring that there's a balance between social need and ecological needs and that they don't um, conflict. There's um, because uh, society is totally dependent on the environment um, but the current sort of capitalist argument is that um, we have to keep on extracting and destroying the environment because people matter um, so what we're talking about is how to put culture and heritage in the donut you know um, in her in her elements of um, society she talks about aspects like education um, healthcare, but she doesn't put culture in the donut so i'm working to try and get people to map culture and understand what its role is um, and so we might come back to this slide at the end when we're talking about the role the new role of culture but i'm always keen I'm always keen to broaden the idea of what culture is so that people are aware that it isn't just about expression. It isn't just about creative industries. People often argue for their small part of the web, um, but this is really an attempt to show how everything, um, uh, we need to work more cross-sectorally. We need to work across the cultural sector. And here's another frame which is um, about working with values. So this is a, 
a model created by an organization based in the UK called Common Cause. Um, and they've been working with some American researchers on a values-based approach. Is this familiar to anyone? Uh, or am I? Okay, I don't think it is familiar to you. So this is a, it's called the value circumplex. And it is a, a model for understanding how people, um, the, the, the values that people are, that are dominant in people and how we can transition people from the, the, the area which is about power and achievement um, to the universal, um, the green. <laughs> um, and what they're finding is that it's possible to find the positive of any of the values that they have to nudge them into more pro-social and pro-environmental values. So if people care a lot about family security, for example, then you can use that to shift people into honouring um, the traditions of, sa of safety and security in other cultures, for example. Um, so yeah, it's about using values to open up people's perspectives. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's taking a positive view of all values, but really trying to expand um, uh, and improve or enhance the way people work together. So, so yes, a little bit more about Climate Museum. Um, and we are, as I said, we registered as an organization in December, so we're still very new. And our first, um, but we tried, um, we tried out our approaches in a series of pop-ups last year. Do you have that phrase in German or <laughs> um, pop-ups? It's, um, yeah, so we pop up in different spaces. And this is a pop-up that we did in Brighton in a gallery called Onka. Um, now, in this, this exhibition was called Climate Talks, and it was really trying to get people to think about how we communicate climate. And we had lots and lots of different activities and tools available for people to try. Um, it was like a lab, really. Um, one of the one of the activities that you can see on the left was writing a letter. So we had lots of different prompts and letter writing tools and invited people to write a letter, for example, to someone of a different generation or to someone in power. And we offered to post those letters for them. Um, the painting above the, the child writing is a commission. We commissioned this painting. Um, it represents some young climate activists the, the girl in the centre is actually a young mother, so she's a, you know, 18-year-old mum. And so it represents that intergenerational um, question of what future will they inherit? inherit? Um, so just moving on. Um, yeah, this shows you a, um, a, a range of some of our early activities, um, experimenting with different methods, whether um, taking people on tour, we did climate tours of Tate Modern, um, you know, to see if we could take the climate museum into other museums. We've done a, um, we've done, gone to festivals, um, we've tried little sort of performances like these winged benches, um, you can see at the bottom getting people to sit in front of pollinator wings and choose their message for their body. So we, we wanted to show that we could do bespoke um, commissions. And I'm just going to stop screen sharing now to show you some of the tools that are actually in my studio. Um, and while I'm just doing that, as I've talked for a while, does anyone have a quick question or need me to clarify anything. No? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little tour of my studio. Um, so as I said, we don't have a building, but uh, we are, I am 
um, keeping all of our main collections in the studio. And so, for example, we are collecting clothing um, and encouraging people to make their own protest clothing. This is by Catherine Hamnett. Um, we're collecting protest ephemera. So we've got, for example, I'm not sure if you can see this, an Extinction Rebellion uh, flag. Um, we are collecting posters, artist books. In, this, in these cupboards, we have um, hundreds of books so that we can actually run uh, climate library events. We have actually run events that focus on books. And for example, we're doing a collaborative reading of this book called The Future We Choose by uh, Christiana Figueres and Tom Karnak. So um, we'll write a blog post um, weaving together people's different thoughts and views on, on the book and what it inspires them to do in the future. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what you can see, but here's just a few of our 40 activities laid out on the table. Um, here we have, this is like a mini museum that I can take. Um, very, it's a very portable um, approach. It's just literally a case of objects and it includes, for example, a, a, an old temperature a weather gauge, um, a solar light. Um, some of the objects are more symbolic um, or multi uh, multi-meaning. <laughs> um, for example, an hourglass, you know, it can be used to have conversations about time running out. So we can do um, lots of activities where people combine and play with objects and tell stories with them. A lot of our resources are um, using cards or, you know, get, um, card games. Um, and we're planning to run climate games lunches with with organizations or you know workplaces so for example well we've put all of the project drawdown solutions on cards and so we can use these for our um posotopia workshops where people can use these cards to imagine future scenarios um we we can do, we do fortune telling. <laughs> um, we, we use these uh, wisdom of nature cards to help people um, Im, um, tell their futures. They focus on a question that's worrying them about the future, like a tarot card reader would. Um, we've got lots of games like, um, uh, we have this game called Bananagrams, where you can make uh, words out of, out of letter tiles and people just lay down the letters um, uh, and and find the the relevance to the climate we, we i'm i'm quite interested in words and concepts so a lot of the activities i've developed are to do with um trying to help people understand systems and relationships between concepts and words Whereas other people in the team are developing other resources that are perhaps much more about um, uh, observing the environment, um, having a sensory relationship to nature. Um, other people are more interested in uh, justice or um, uh, telling stories about people's experience of climate in different in different places. So we all we are all growing as a team and growing this central collection of resources and activities. Um, oh, I've just, another aspect is storytelling. And um, uh, one of our team, Becky Leach is a storyteller. And we have, my daughter made for me, made for us this um, climate striped jacket. So it's a kimono um, that goes from blue to, to red. And when you wear it, you can say, I am climate change ask me a question or you know I am climate change I'm going to tell you a story so um, I, that's really a very very rapid um, <laughs> a little look at some of the tools that we have and these are really just prototypes and things will develop over the over the months and years so I'm just going to go back to 
screen sharing again, just to know what's next. Um, ah, yes, just to, uh, the next step for us is really trying to uh, make our workshop process and our ethos very concrete so that new freelancers, new um, practitioners can work with us and know what the ideal um, structure of an activity is and we're focusing on the process of taking people from feeling through to thinking and then knowing what they can do so feel think and do so on the on the left you can see this um, confession box climate confession box so we don't actually believe that people should feel guilty about their their environmental actions but we ask the question, what do you feel guilty about? They write it on a piece of paper and they put it in the box and they turn a handle and somebody else's secret comes out. So they feel they're not alone. But then we want to move them on to realizing that actually the big system means that they are not guilty. Um, so then, you know, it's about getting people together to think and understand and then plan action. I should say as well another thing that we're doing is, is music. Um, we've been running some climate music events and um, enabling people to express their emotions that way. Um, so yeah I'm going to return then to screen sharing and to just talk through a little bit about some research that we're doing. And we're um, wanting to work more with a psychologist called Dr. Renee Lertzman, who's American, um, and she's a, an expert in climate emotions and coping strategies. So you might want to, I, I can write her name in the chat for you to investigate her work. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this... Um, uh, screen here is actually a really large poster that we roll out and um, put up on the wall and we give people several post-its so that they can express different emotions we don't assume that people only have one and then they can um, make and share an artwork or perhaps write a short poem or or song um, so um, and another activity that we've done is um, inspired by the film The Matrix, which is um, uh, where they, uh, you've probably heard of this before, um, Neo is asked to choose between facing living in reality or, or carrying on in comfortable ignorance. So the red pill is to see the truth of life in the present. Um, and so we suggest, you know, we hold out two choices of, of sweets to people and say, do you want to take the blue pill of staying um, in the, the climate of the past or do you want to actually face the truth of, of, of the red pill of what's happening now and unfolding in the future. Um, so this is a kind of trigger for conversation. I should say though that it can be quite powerful and um, exploring these things can bring people together but it can also raise a lot of uncomfortable emotions and differences between people. Um, and so um, we wanted to really get deeper into this um, so that we could be better informed as a team because the, you know, the emotional side of things is probably the most um, difficult to engage with. Of course, the, the technicalities and the science and the content is, is really, really complex too, but we really have to have our, um, our understanding of emotions and strategies for working with people really nailed down. So um, we've begun by commissioning, by running a survey, which is still live, asking people about their emotions and coping strategies. We commissioned a film from a young person where he interviewed lots of his friends um, asking about their emotions. We used the climate confessions box, and the poster and um, so just a few uh, this the survey is still live so this is really just a snapshot at the moment um, so when people imagine the future they most often imagine disaster 
but survival in some pockets and people interestingly do also imagine other species and wildlife suffering so it isn't just you know imagining human suffering um, the most common feelings are sad frustrated anxious um, yeah frustrated is a very strong one so that you know and frustration is a, a condition that leads to to anxiety and stress when you feel that you have no power um, and you can see people doing things wrong around you and you you know you can't do anything about it um, and so we also asked about people's coping strategies i know the the format is quite hard to read here but the most common coping strategies are connecting with nature um, but also taking action to reduce my footprint in some way so many people know that um, you know just doing small things might not um, might not bring us out of disaster but it does model change it shows people um, uh, the better way to be so you know what's it's important when you take action to tell people that you've done so um, even though that might open you up to being accused of being, you know, an echo nag or something. Um, but we have to be, we have to be brave. Um, so we, we have these um, conversations. We've had a conversation about different ways that people cope with climate change and we've organized them into five different areas. So the most, um, uh, problematic area the area that keeps people in a state of frustration is denial based strategies and these are the most common so at the far extreme this is really negative absolutely denying that climate the climate science and then there are more constructive types of denial that are saying things like it won't affect us here or it won't affect us for decades so um, this can lead people to um, hedonism or escapism. Um, then there are emotion based strategies where people express emotion. Um, but there are some less constructive aspects to it. So if people express emotion in their bubbles of people, they can just kind of um, reinforce uh, negative, you know, they can reinforce or rehearse their anxiety. Um, quite often um, an emotion based strategy is also um, a deferral so you know play doing something else instead you know playing on a phone or playing a game is is an emotion based strategy um, then more positive are problem based strategies so this is when um, you, you know you tr when you're frustrated you try to solve the problem and you try to solve the problem that's in front of you. Um, so people say things like, when I take action, I feel like I'm doing something. Um, but the problem with this is that if the crisis worsens, you feel like you, you're, you still feel frustrated because your small efforts are not making a difference. Um, and if you've persuaded others to take action, you might feel that you've betrayed them. Um, and so a more positive approach is meaning based strategies where your problem solving is rooted in a broader understanding, um, more historical or more, um, uh, more open so that you can um, think about other people's perspectives as well. Um, so a meaning based strategy might include, um, uh, you know, focusing on on reasons for help or being sort of um, find, you know, finding motivational quotes, that kind of thing. Um, but um, these can be fragile if there is no action or change. But the most positive strategies for dealing with your emotions are what we call prefigurative strategies. So um, prefiguring means imagining 
how things might be better and then working out steps to build that better future so it's not just taking small actions like not using plastic bags it's it's actually deciding um, to set up a campaign to stop plastic bags in your community or your country or um, and then finding an alternative so that people are using different kinds of bags and then trying to change behaviors so that people don't need bags at all so it's a, it's a progressive um, approach and always expanding and always trying to find new solutions um, and it means constantly imagining scenarios and constantly thinking about how change can be levered for the best and it actually also means having being constantly educating yourself and accessing data I can't remember who it was who was talking about having dashboards of information that help people make decisions. So prefigurative strategies are um, the only negative about these is that it does mean that people start to become more active. It means that they start taking direct action and um, that means that they can be in conflict with authorities and, um, and with other people who criticize them and then that, that can cause burnout. So those people need to um, <clears throat> have a combination of um, direct action that stops harm with um, living in a more pro-environmental way um, so that they can retreat, um, you know, and, 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 live in, and live in a way that changes the, the world as well as demanding change. So those are the, the, the areas of um, coping strategy. And we're kind of interested in how a museum can um, uh, promote the most prefigurative coping strategies. So we're, we call ourselves an activist museum. Um, as a community interest company, we're not actually allowed to be political. So being an activist museum while also being a non-political organization is a little bit tricky um, but it's um, it's uh, very interesting and so at this point i want to know if you have any questions <laughs>